I'm going to invite um, Barry to bring us our reading. Thanks, Barry. Uh, we're reading today from Hebrews. Your word, O Lord, is a lamp to our feet. And a light to our path. High priest, chosen from among mortals, is put in charge of things pertaining to God on their behalf, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with the ignorant and wayward, since he himself is subject to weakness. And because of this, he must offer sacrifice for his own sins as well as for those of the people. And one does not presume to take this honour, but takes it only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who were by him, having been designated by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. The Gospel reading is from Mark in the 10th chapter. <clears throat> James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and said, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptised with the baptism that I am baptised with? They replied, we are able. Then Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink you will drink, and with the baptism with which I am baptised you will be baptised. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant to you, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John, so Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognise as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. Whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. May your word live in us. And bear much fruit to your glory. Lord, your life's example shows us how to lead with humility and how to serve others. May the words we hear this morning open our hearts and enliven the Holy Spirit in our lives to love and serve you and all people. Amen. I'm sure that throughout your lives, all of you have dreamed dreams. Yeah, all of us. We dream about the future. We dream about career. We dream hundreds and thousands of dreams of how life will go for us. As a child, I dreamed of becoming a teacher. <laughs> it didn't happen, but I did become an integration aid, which was almost second best. Also, I became a, a guide leader as well. So I guess that helped a lot. 
And when I was young, I dreamed. When I was riding my push bike, I dreamed of riding a motorbike, zipping here and zipping there, and the wind in my hair and the bugs in my teeth. And guess what? I did. I did ride a motorbike for quite a number of years. I did get cleaned up by a car, and uh, that wasn't terribly exciting, but, but I survived, although I did promise that I would never ride a bike again. But the lure of the, <laughs> of the motorbike, especially when we joined the classic bike club, was a bit too much. And it's only recently that I sold my classic Tiger Triumph cub um, to a gentleman down in Tasmania. And when I went down to visit friends in Tasmania and saw my motorbike, it looked pretty specko. He said, do you want to take it for a spin? And I thought, no, <laughs> I haven't ridden enough. So many times our dreams don't happen because sometimes the dreams we dream might change because of circumstances, because our circumstances change, or they might not be good for us. In our Gospel reading this morning, James and John had a dream, and they dreamed to be the second most important people in the kingdom that Jesus had spoken about. Now, last week, of course, you probably remember hearing about the rich young ruler, the man who was seeking eternal life, and Jesus told him that the way to find life was to give up his wealth and to follow him. And Jesus talked again with the disciples about the cost of discipleship and how the first will be last and the last will be first. And he told the disciples, we're going to Jerusalem because the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and handed over to the Gentiles and the Gentiles will spit on him and mock him and flog him and kill him. And three days later he would rise. So once again, Jesus is telling his disciples what will happen to him. And again, we ask ourselves whether the disciples were really listening or whether their knowledge of the power and might of an earthly Messiah was clouding their thoughts. So James and John, bless them, the two of his disciples approached Jesus to ask him, a favour. And I don't know about you, but don't you just love it when people come and say, uh, would, you, uh, would you do a favour for me? Would you agree to do it before you've even been told? Does that ever happen to you? It happens to us all the time, doesn't it? But then they ask for favour. Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. Now Mark doesn't tell us whether Jesus was a little bit suspicious. He doesn't even tell us whether he thought maybe it might have been not the right thing. But he encouraged them to ask. And they said, and he said to them, so what do you want me to do for you? And James and John sort of stammer out something like this. Well, Jesus, you know that glory thing that you've been talking about and teaching us about along the road? We want to talk to you about um, reserving some seats for it. Now, we did some maths, and there's two of us. And so we figured, because there were two of us, there'd be two spots. And uh, we figured that it'd be really good if we could reserve a couple of seats, preferably the one on the left and the one on the right. And, uh, you know, I reckon that'd be pretty good, don't you think? What do you reckon, Jesus? And Jesus had indeed been talking about glory in chapter 8, and it seems that James and John had heard the bit about the glory but it seems they missed the bit about being mocked and spat on and flogged and killed. So Jesus reminded them of the cup of suffering and his upcoming death and asked them if they were prepared to go down that track. 
And when they answered that they would indeed suffer and die at the hands of others, it did actually happen in the future. So James and John, along with the other disciples, had the wrong idea of the Messiah's kingdom as predicted in the Old Testament prophets. And they thought that it would be an earthly kingdom and that, would, that the one that would overthrow the Romans and free Israel. And James and John would have been involved in that uh, argument with the other disciples about who was the greatest since they couldn't prove anything in that discussion, they kind of went via the back door, so to speak, and uh, or they tried to jump the queue. And they were certain that they deserved an honoured place in the great kingdom. And being at the right and left of Jesus, well, that was about as good as it gets, eh? They didn't understand at the time that the kingdom that Jesus was speaking about was the kingdom of God in the hearts and minds of people. A kingdom not of this world. A kingdom where Jesus would be the mediator for all who would seek the Lord and speak to God on our behalf. Jesus had no need to give James and John a lecture for trying to cue jump or putting themselves first because you would all know, you would all assume that the other disciples were certainly extremely cross with them. And I can imagine they gave James and John quite a talking to. And then Jesus calls the disciples together and he told them again, that true greatness comes in serving others. And this cuts against what happens in our world today. You know, most business organisations expect you to be a high flyer, expect you to um, achieve greatly, even at the expense of climbing on the shoulders of other people in order to get to where you're going. And even in Jesus' time, money and prestige and high office were considered a real blessing and something to be aimed for. But Jesus explains again to them that the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And Jesus demonstrated that type of service by washing the disciples' feet on the night before he was betrayed and he went to the cross as a ransom for the sin of the world. Back then a ransom price was paid to release the slave and Jesus paid the ransom for us because we were unable to pay it ourselves. His humble and obedient death released us from the slavery of sin. I mean, how awesome is that? Isn't that amazing? The Son of God humbled himself to serve us by being a ransom for all of us. And Jesus humbled himself and died and rose and ascended to heaven where we read in Hebrews that Jesus became our high priest. Now, there are a couple of qualifications to be a high priest. And uh, one is that the priest must be sympathetic, gentle and patient with those who go astray through ignorance or unintentionally or through weakness. And the second is that the high priest must be appointed by God must be appointed by God. And Jesus fits all the criteria and he is in heaven interceding for us and he knows what it's like to live in the world, to be a human being. When Jesus was on earth, he was fully human. He had the same struggles, the same choices, the same doubts that we have. And we need to remember 
that Jesus' human life was not a script to be passively followed. It was a way of life, a way that Jesus chose, and I'll emphasise that chose freely. It was a continuous process of making the will of God Jesus' own will. And Jesus chose to obey, even though that obedience led to suffering and death. So Jesus is the example back then, and Jesus' example for us today are the very essence of servanthood. Now, I can see most of you sitting back going, yes, but I've done amazing things in my life. I've done amazing things in my life. Every now and again, they throw honours at you and tell you you're fantastic. So I'm not bagging anybody who's achieving greatness. Being in a top job at work and being a leader in an organisation is important because leaders are needed, yes? Yes, of course they are. But Jesus encourages us not to lord it over people, but to work with them to achieve a goal. And Jesus led by his amazing example. To be great, you have to give to achieve. You have to sacrifice to follow Jesus. You have to give up yourself and follow him. I have a commentary book at home on the book of Mark, obviously. Um, one has wall-to-wall library of books when you do ministry things. But it's entitled, The Servant King, Reading Mark Today. And I reckon that's absolutely spot on. Jesus left the heights of heaven to come as one of us, a human, to walk on this earth and to struggle with life, just as we do. He showed complete servanthood by giving his life to bring us back into a close and loving relationship with God. I mean, what an amazing saviour. What an example for us to follow. Jesus, the high priest and king, master, servant and lord, This is indeed our God, the Servant King. Amen.